dedicated to earthlings everywhere who labor and toil daily for food and shelter. Chapter 1. The Money Trap Humans have been on this planet for a long time, and for as long as we have lived here, we have been working, laboring our life away. And for what? We have nothing to collectively show for all this hard work over billions of lifespans. We see nothing but more work and labor for future generations indefinitely when we look forward to the future. What happened here? Where is our equity as earthlings? It's as if we are stuck paying a mortgage that can never be paid off. We never gain any equity, and the bank still owns 100% of the house despite us working and paying the mortgage for centuries. Why buy the house in the first place, if that is what will happen? A very depressing scenario when you look at it, indeed. This is the result of having a wealth of a few men surpass the combined monetary worth of entire countries. Most people don't realize that if an individual has millions, billions, or even trillions in their bank account just sitting there, that's not just money sitting in a bank. That is the collective equity of millions of years in human labor that is not doing anything for humanity. Once a person has surpassed the amount of money necessary to sustain their lives and the lives of their family for generations, then there is no use in having any more money just sitting in a bank somewhere collecting interest while not being put to work to relieve human strife. So how did this happen? Ambitious people have always found ways to accumulate wealth in the form of their time. So how is this different? Between the 9th and 15th centuries, Europe feudalism was the dominant social system. The nobility amassed private armies to take land from each other. They quickly realized that they could enrich themselves much easier by running a protection scheme on the common man to hand over control of their family lands. The scam worked by offering protection from foreign warlords in exchange for handing over held lands to the crown. In exchange for military service, Independent landowners were in turn tenants of the nobles, peasants, villains, serfs and servants, debt slaves, were obliged to live on their lord's land and give him homage, labor and a share of all crops and spoils from the land. Feudalism lasted until the great migration of Europeans to the Americas between 1492 and the 1800s. Approximately 2.6 million Europeans were happy to flee feudalism, many of them as indentured servants for the opportunity to become free landowners once again. Then, a significant economic change started in the mid-1800s. It was the Industrial Revolution. Before that, most skilled work was done by skilled tradesmen who were either self-employed or enslaved. There was only one way to get work done. A human or animal had to do it. But with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, suddenly a third way to get a job done was invented, with machines and the development of factories. The economic shift moved leverage from slave labor to machine labor, and as a result, the world changed from an agricultural-based economy into an industrialized one. To capitalize on this new technology, the industrialist needed educated people to run the factories, operate the machines, and fix, build, and maintain the technologies. These industrialists, such as John Pierpont Morgan, aka J.P. Morgan, born April 17, 1837, the American financier and industrial organizer Andrew Carnegie, Steele, and John D. Rockefeller, an oil entrepreneur, played an essential role in the development of the new economic system. The industrialist influenced the government to organize a public school system to prepare a workforce for this new economy. This public school system was designed to give people a free compartmentalized education. 
smart enough to be helpful, but not well-rounded enough to be financially free, independent, or see the whole picture. Like the factories and assembly lines that created individual spokes that would be assembled into a wheel to be placed on a bicycle. As a result, men whose fathers were skilled, self-employed, small business owners, plumbers, ranchers, butchers, blacksmiths, and so on, were converted to employees who worked for one of the giant consolidated industrial companies that ate them up and spat them out while creating barons of industries and millionaires. Since then, the ordinary person has never earned much more than their family's living expenses. Many retired penniless, even to this day. The introduction of technology into the workforce sparked the Industrial Revolution beginning in the 1760s. According to Moore's Law, technological efficiency grows exponentially year over year. For example, in today's technology, every 18 months, computer processing speed doubles. As a result, capitalists could capture the exponential increases in workplace efficiencies and stash it away in their bank accounts as money. Most of the money accumulated since that time was never infused back into the economy for the benefit of humanity. Industry barons like Henry Ford and his family became obscenely wealthy. Recent billionaires like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Bill Gates continue the same trend. Even generous charity is not enough to reverse this trend, not to mention the influence such individuals have over the trajectory of human society. During the 1920s, the automobile industry became the backbone of a new consumer goods-oriented society. By the mid-1920s, it ranked first in the value of the product, and in 1982 it provided one out of every six jobs in the United States. Every screw was screwed in by a human hand in the first cars. But as machines became more advanced, fewer humans were needed for the same work. Technology evolution allowed car manufacturers to reduce the human labor time required to produce an automobile by some units with each iteration. For instance, let's say 40 hours a week which allows the company to fire one human worker to save the company money instead of laying off that human worker? What if the company simply reduced the work week from 40 hours to 39 hours for each human worker at the plant while maintaining the same salary for all? The plant did not lose production capacity. However, it freed one hour of human time to enjoy life and raise a family instead of working. Imagine that this happened in every company and government worldwide as more advanced technology and better machines take over more and more labor. Eventually, we could all have a 20-hour work week instead of a 40-hour work week, which would allow more time for everyone in the society to spend nurturing their children, learning new skills, and making discoveries that will further ease the strains of life. Eventually, we may all only have to work a few hours a month, perhaps even not for the first 30 years of our lives. Paying workers back with their own time is the most valuable and effective way to allow everyone to share in the equity of human advancement and ingenuity. It also prevents inflation completely. Sure, a few lazy people will sit at home and do nothing, but that's okay. The vast majority of people would pursue their passions to benefit us all. This is the effect that men like Andrew Yang are trying to achieve by advancing the concept of Universal Basic Income, UBI. Instead, the company owner uses less human labor to produce goods faster due to technological advances. The increased efficiency results in more enormous profits 
that the owner places in his bank account. The owner's bank account size increases beyond what his family can use within their lifetimes. Most of the time, their money is just sitting in a virtual world seen as digits on a computer screen, doing absolutely nothing for anyone. Until the problem is fixed, Earthlings will be trapped in the debt of their birth. And make no mistake, debt is slavery. The only way to relieve debt is to pay it off. And the only way to make money is to work. And work for survival forced labor. Traditional slavery was too expensive for the enslaver because they had to pay for the living expenses of the enslaved person. But in modern society, labor is controlled by wages, thus creating the self-financed slave who is responsible for feeding, housing, and securing themselves. This type of slavery does not discriminate by race. Still, it enslaves all people from birth to benefit a few who manipulate wages and economic inflation from the top of the pyramid while storing the sweat equity of most humans as digits inside a computer network displayed on their bank account screens. The capitalist ideology documented by men such as Adam Smith in his writings, The Wealth of Nations, encourages each human to pursue their self-interest because it will produce a more efficient society. Yet capitalism has created a monetary-based economy that has a compound effect on both wealth and poverty. When we add selfishness and abuse of labor, it leaves us at the point where we are now, having nothing but our own labor remaining, which is what we started with a long time ago. It's not that capitalism is useless, but money itself became the measuring stick by which everything is valued within capitalism. This is dangerous because of the emphasis on the role of self in Chapter 2. Bad Money Very rarely do humans do bad things because they are bad people. Humans often commit immoral acts to fulfill what they believe is a need. It is a human need and the necessity to pay for all survival needs with money, which results in people doing things like cutting corners or taking the cheap way out when making a product. Poorly made products are a result of the human survival instinct that can only be satisfied with money. Many times, cutting corners can result in damaging the person who buys the product. A businessman who cuts corners does so all to save a few dollars or squeeze out a little extra profit. The businessman does not cut corners to cause injury to a customer, yet these types of actions often lead to an injury. For example, a thing such as good quality food and bad quality food should not exist. All food should be the same, good quality. However, a food company may decide to use pesticides to increase the number of apples they harvest, thereby allowing them to sell more apples and lose less to insects. That pesticide may have harmful side effects. The company then offers an organic version of the apple that does not have dangerous side effects and sells it for more than the one with pesticides. Now you have two different quality levels of the same product. The customer is now forced to eat a crappy apple if they want to save money. Some customers will not be able to afford the organic version of the apple, so they buy the regular apple. As a result, the customer develops allergies that increase their medical bills. The customer then takes the cheapest version of an allergy medicine they could find. As a result, the allergy medicine affects their hormones. The change in hormones causes a genetic defect in the customer's newborn baby. This scenario can go on and on, but at each turning point, the choice was made because the individual's survival was directly tied to how much money they had and as a result, they tried to save a few or make a few extra bucks. 
Had the scenario been one in which the individual's survival needs were not tied to money or if the money itself was designed differently and optimized for health results, then it would be irrelevant to try and make a few extra dollars, save a few bucks, cut corners, or take the cheap way out. The only concern would be what is best for the product's end user. Since the farmer won't have to pay for his family's food or shelter with faulty, poorly designed money, there is no need to grow an apple that has harmful side effects in the first place. If you tell a human being that their very survival depends on them having a particular thing, it is the instinct of that human to accumulate as much of it as possible. Humans are not wired to just acquire the number of resources needed for their family's survival. Humans are built to get as much as humanly possible of a necessary thing. The strength of the human survival instinct is not based on the practicality of having enough, but on the feeling of having all needs met. This type of irrationality that an adequately designed money economic system that optimized the correct traits would control. Concepts such as owning land and water trigger competitive survivalist behaviors. How can a human own something that will exist much longer than human life? The idea of taking control of a piece of land or water and then charging another human a price for it is criminal in itself. The earth does not charge for using its land or water. Why then should one human charge another? Or a government tax a human for owning it? Poorly designed money then becomes a barrier to human survival and causes conflicts. All living things owe their survival to the land and water abundantly available on the earth. All that is required to survive on the planet is human labor and intellect. No one should own land. Instead, land should only be held by its primary users. Much worse than a human owning land is when a corporate entity owns the land. Corporations owning land creates the scenario whereby land is held only for profit by entities that do not use it directly while still being able to suck the benefits from it. This type of arrangement enslaves people. The entire concept of requiring proof of land ownership in the form of a deed is proof that the land in question is stolen land. Think about it. If the land indeed belonged to you, then everyone would know that it's your land because it has been in your family for generations. You and your family live on the land, so there is no reason to prove that you own it with a piece of paper. However, if you stole the land, you would need proof to protect yourself from other thieves stealing it from you. After all, there is no honor among thieves. Examine the following scenario. An invading force kills the inhabitants and takes their land. To avoid conflict among the invaders, there had to be a way to prove who a piece of land was awarded and a clear way for a court to settle if there was more than one claim to the same piece of land. The invaders, having left their homeland to seek out the land of others, will start a business or corporation around the use of the land to enrich themselves at the expense of the original inhabitants. The government would then make it their business to tax the profits gained by the corporation to fund the entire structure. A structure based on theft and greed. Many such corporations ruled countries as if they were governments. Corporations owning land is equivalent to banks borrowing at 0% interest and then lending the same money at 4% interest to borrowers. Corporations typically manage to get something for free and then charge others for it. An easy example would be Poland Springs, the water company. Water companies get fresh drinkable water freely from the earth, then bottle it 
and sell it for a profit around the world. Meanwhile, the United Nations World Water Development Report stated that nearly 6 billion people will suffer from clean water scarcity by 2050. The same thing happens with the 401k and pension plans. A custodian receives the employee's pay for free with strict penalties for the employee should they request their money back before retirement. Meanwhile, the custodian freely invests the employee's salary and enjoys the profits immediately, while only being obligated to return the employee a small portion of any profits many decades later. But if something goes wrong and the custodian mismanages the money, as was the case with the corporate giant Enron, the employees of Enron held nearly 60% of their retirement assets in company stock. As the company sank toward bankruptcy, Enron was changing plan providers, which prevented employees from selling shares. Simultaneously, Enron executives with personal holdings outside the 401k were unloading their shares. The company's executives defrauded their shareholders and employees out of $74 billion in life savings that they will never get back. Long before corporate giants like Enron, Apple, Google, or Amazon, the English East India Company was one of the biggest, most dominant corporations in history. It was incorporated by Royal Charter on December 31, 1600. It went on to act as a part trade organization and part nation state and reap vast profits from overseas trade with India, China, Persia, and Indonesia for more than two centuries. The Royal African Company, RAC, was an English mercantile trading company set up in 1660 by the Royal Stuart family and City of London merchants to trade along the west coast of Africa. It was led by the Duke of York, who was the brother of Charles II, and later took the throne as James II. It shipped more enslaved Africans to the Americas than any other company. The Hudson Bay Company, HBC, chartered on May 2, 1670, is the oldest incorporated joint stock merchandising company in the English-speaking world. HBC was a fur trading business for most of its history, a past entwined with the colonization of British North America and the development of Canada. The Dutch East India Company, 1602 to 1799, officially the United East India Company, was a multinational corporation founded by a government-directed consolidation of several rival Dutch trading companies in the early 17th century. It is believed to be the largest company ever in recorded history. The Dutch West India Company, or WIC, 1621 to 1791. The slave trade of the Dutch West India Company Founded 400 years ago, the Dutch West India Company waged war at sea and colonized territories in West Africa and the Caribbean until its dissolution in 1791. The WIC not only traded in goods but also in people. For the human ego, capitalism is attractive because it enables those who are strong enough to attain while cursing those who can't. It produces a polarizing effect that can only be enjoyed by part, but never by the whole. For this reason, people like me enjoy the challenge of capitalism because it is a eat-what-you-kill model that satisfies my ego. However, this kind of selfishness leaves large sums of the population without inheritance doomed to feel the sting of poverty while wallowing in the bliss of ignorance. The alternative to the eat-what-you-kill model, capitalism, 
is the PAC model, a resource-based economy, where the inheritance is shared and invested in the people to ensure the future survival and continued improvement of the PAC. This would allow each generation to build into the collective equity of the previous until millions of lifespans worth of human equity have been realized. This would enable each newborn earthling to be born debt free. We would be better off than our grandparents rather than worse off. This economic model could not work with the fiat based money system but blockchain technology-based money systems and some alternate and future iterations of cryptocurrencies could, especially when combined with Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, DAOs. The technology for this next evolution of money already exists. Chapter 3. The Invention of Banks the single most significant event has been the invention of the modern banking system that gives the illusion of real value to worthless paper money controlled by private banks. While the monetary system enables items of real value, that is food, oil, land, wood, etc., to be readily exchanged for it, it is a trick, an illusion whether it is paper, money, coins, or cards. What is money and how did it come about? In the old times, people would exchange one tangible resource for another, or in the case of a market setting, several people would exchange many tangible resources with each other, otherwise known as the barter system. As societies became more modern, there became a need to have a medium of exchange that could easily be measured. A dollar, for example, is a unit of measure like a gallon or a pound of a commodity. In all seriousness, when someone says, give me twenty dollars, your response should be, twenty dollars of what? That's all money is, a median or temporary holding state of something of value in a specific amount. The same as ice can be a temporary holding state of water. The real purpose of money should not have been to become the permanent holding instrument for value as it became. Let's say that I am a carpenter and I have some wood and you are a butcher and you have some beef. I need beef, but you don't need any wood. How would we exchange? How do we both get what we both need? How can we trade and do business? This is why the medium of exchange became useful. Since you don't need any wood, I can exchange money instead, and you can go and get whatever you need. Money is essentially whatever you want it to be. The current form of money is different from earlier iterations. Money was also a tangible resource, such as gold, silver, or a real commodity. Today, money is simply a number printed on fancy paper or some digits on a computer screen. How individuals get money and who controls its value of it is the crucial thing. Let's suppose you are a farmer and own a lot of natural and tangible resources. However, you need to develop your farm to build an income for yourself as the monetary system demands. So. You go to a bank and ask for a loan of $100,000. The banker looks at you and asks, Okay, what do you have as collateral? You tell the banker that you have a lot of land, animals, and wood. The banker says, Okay, we will accept that. You put up your farm as collateral, and the bank loans you the $100,000. What did you just do? In essence, you just handed over something of real value in exchange for something of no real value. As if that wasn't bad enough, the bank is still in control of the value of what they remitted to you because the bank controls interest rates that they use to inflate 
and deflate the value of the money they just loaned you. So, you borrow the money to buy tractors and other farm equipment. When you took out the loan, a tractor cost $10,000. But now, a tractor costs $12,500. It's not that the tractor went up in value. It's that your money went down in value due to inflation. And who controls inflation? The bank. In other words, if I were to loan you $5, but I have a string made of inflation attached to the $5, and as soon as you walk away from me, I pull the string, suddenly your $5 is worth $4.50. I pull it again a few days later, and now it's worth $4, then $3, then $2.25, then down to two dollars. However, as in the previous example, the bank will own your farm if you fail to repay the loan with the agreed interest at the inflated rates. Your farm's value will not decrease, but the value of the money you borrowed will. It will also cost you more if you ever had to buy another farm after the bank foreclosed on the farm you put up for collateral. Banks came about because large amounts of gold were too cumbersome to carry around. In those days, men carried purses because they had gold coins. But you can imagine that large transactions involving bars of gold can be very strenuous, which is why banking became useful. So you would place gold on deposit, and the bank would issue you a deposit receipt a certificate of guarantee, or a banknote, later became known as money. Business merchants would exchange a banknote, which was the proof of how much gold they had on deposit for goods and services. Then the merchant would go to the bank and present the banknote to take possession of the gold or just exchange it again with another merchant. Each town had its bank and printed its own notes in those days. The number of notes issued was determined by how much gold reserves each bank had in its vaults. The bankers realized that only they knew how much gold they had on deposit. So, they took advantage of that opportunity by printing more notes than they had gold. Since the banknote was as good as gold, people readily exchanged it and the bankers became wealthy from this scheme. This was the beginning of the pyramid scheme that continues to this day. They knew that it was unlikely that every depositor would come to withdraw their gold simultaneously, so they just recycled the deposits and withdrawals. All gold looked the same anyways and was measured by weight. Eventually, Larger banks took over the local banks until only one central bank supplied money to all the local banks based on gold, its gold reserves. Then came the fractional lending system, which made it legal for banks to lend out more money than the value in their vaults. Thus, if the reserve requirement is 10%, a bank that receives a $100 deposit may lend out $1,000. During the Great Depression in the United States from 1929 to 1932, what the bankers thought would never happen did finally happen. A wave of bank runs happened when depositors in large numbers panicked and withdrew their funds at once, causing then-President Franklin D. Roosevelt on March 12th 1933 to close all banks. Then, in 1933, he proceeded to outlaw private gold ownership, except for jewelry. Gold was taken out of the picture entirely, with the exception that the value of paper money was still stabilized by the fixed price of an ounce of gold. Then, on August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon ended the set price of an ounce of gold, allowing money's value to become unstable. 
With the gold standard erased, banks went to a fiat currency. The words printed on the dollar bill changed from this bill is redeemable in gold to this bill is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So what exactly is a fiat currency? A fiat currency holds value by mutual agreement. For example, all the citizens of a country agree to accept a means of exchange by mutually agreeing to do so. It's also accepted by order of the government, meaning that the money has value because the government has ordered it to be so. This order is backed by the full military might of the government and its willingness to force anyone to accept the currency. Should one country not agree to accept the currency of another, it could cause a war. Money has been and remains the only reason for war. The value of a fiat currency is ruled by world supply and demand and is inflated or deflated by interest rates reasonably easily. This is why gas used to be 50 cents per gallon, but it's now $4 per gallon. It is not that gas went up, it is the value of the money used to purchase gas that went down. Once a currency becomes a fiat, its value doesn't exist. Instead, a holding value in tangible resources, it has become common for people to keep it in the means of exchange, especially a fiat medium of exchange that does not have any real value like real estate means real and tangible property. All economies of empires eventually reach the point of having a fiat currency. They all go through the same stages. All empires start with money of real value, which is precious because of its limited quantities, to allow the rich to enjoy their money without interruption by the revolt of the poor the empire implemented social programs to meet the survival needs of its poor for food and shelter. In the United States, this is done with programs such as food stamps and Section 8 housing projects. The empire's wealth is poured into expanding its military. The expanded military is put to use in unnecessary wars. The wars drive up the expenses of the empire. As a result, the money is replaced with a type of money that can be produced in unlimited quantity and is of no real value, such as paper money, fiat money. The value of the new money continues to decrease inflation, which is seen by the people as if the cost of tangible goods such as food is increasing. The wealthy begin to move their wealth out of the valueless money and back into the land, real estate, precious commodities such as gold, cotton, and silver. The price of precious commodities increases drastically because of the new demand and the fact that the fiat money has no real value and eventually dies. Those who have not moved their wealth back into items of real value will be left bankrupt. At its peak in 117 CE, the Roman Empire covered some 2.3 million square miles, 5.9 million square kilometers, over three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It is estimated that perhaps 60 million people lived within its borders. It was one of the largest and most powerful empires in the ancient world, the Roman monetary system had stood firm for almost two and a half centuries. The Roman monetary system, anchored by the denarius, was remarkably stable. But imperial expenses tended to exceed tax revenue. The emperors relied on new gold and silver from mines and successful wars to make up the difference. When these supplies fell short, there were only two possible solutions. Deferring payment was always dangerous, since unpaid soldiers were mutinous soldiers, or debasing the currency, 
making coins, in other words, that contained less gold and silver, which they did several times. During the reign of Marcus Aurelius, Rome had a string of many catastrophic events, including a terrible pandemic and long wars that tax revenues could not cover. The Roman economy splintered at the worst time when the emperor desperately needed gold and silver to pay the troops. Inflation spiked as the emperor debased the currency. The Aureus, whose size and quality had been stable for two and a half centuries, was reduced from a pure gold coin, weighing a little over seven grams, to an alloyed fragment that sometimes weighed less than one gram. At the same time, the silver coin purity was debased out of existence in attempts to squeeze more purchasing power out of available silver. Inflation shows price increases in the cost of goods. For example, the price of bread in Rome tripled over the second century. By the year 268, both the empire and its economy were on the brink of disintegration. The empire had broken into three parts as German tribes were ravaging northern Italy. This was all caused by a faulty monetary system that was arbitrarily manipulated by politicians, unlike a cryptocurrency-based monetary system that is decentralized, trustless, secured, global, divisible, and free from government interference. In the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank controls the value of money, just like other central banks do worldwide. The Federal Reserve owns and operates the central bank that controls and prints all money for the entire country. For the privilege of printing the money for the country, all the citizens pay the Federal Reserve interest via taxes on all the money that they print. The citizens also allow the Federal Reserve to manipulate interest rates on their behalf. However, just because it is called Federal Reserve does not mean that it is part of the government or controlled by the government. The central bank is a privately owned institution. They are best classified as a private contractor. Their job is to print Federal Reserve notes, FRN, or promissory notes, otherwise known as dollar bills. Why would the citizens of a country pay a private bank to control its money? That's a great question. The United States Constitution gives that power to Congress. I have no idea why they would allow another organization to take that power. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which some say is unconstitutional, gave the privately operated Fed sole authority over printing money. This was also the same year the first income tax law was passed, enabling the government to tax human labor. The Federal Reserve is a misnomer. It is not federal, nor are there any reserves. They print money at will and loan it to smaller banks who pay it back with interest. Since the Fed creates money out of nothing, it can loan it out at low interest rates. Banks, therefore, can charge people slightly higher interest rates when they borrow, so they can buy homes, a bigger car, or start a business. This scheme of creating something out of nothing in unlimited supply and then selling it to someone else creates inflation which drives prices up and eventually makes everyone's dollar worth less. So when people say that crypto is created out of thin air, they are correct. But that is also true for traditional currencies, like fiat currency, Bitcoin, or most cryptocurrencies, is not backed by any gold or silver, hence does not have any intrinsic value. One of the main differences is that Bitcoin has a fixed supply and no more can be created out of thin air 
once all Bitcoins have been mined. No matter which type, money has value exclusively because we collectively agree it has value. Without that, money is just paper, or even more commonly, a number in a database representing your bank account and crypto is just cryptographic mathematical calculations. Banks create promissory notes, now known as dollars, but it is actually a contract. The terms of the contract determine what type of promise it is. For example, some promissory notes, such as a bank loan, have a date for specific performance and an amount. In the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank creates a Federal Reserve Note, FRN, or dollar bills, and it's an open promise without a date for specific performance, but the payee promises to pay one day. A promise to pay is only as strong as the person making the promise, and if it is acceptable to the seller. Typically, a promissory note is made binding by the payee's signature. Therefore, your signature can and does create promissory notes that are currency. FRNs do not have your signature, so it is not your promise but a public promise. FRNs are public debt. What we are really doing when we promise to pay with FRNs is pass around public debt among ourselves. Nothing is actually being paid. Since the currency is not backed by anything of real value, nothing can be paid with it. With each commercial transaction, we increase public debt. On a larger scale, each country passes debt around in trade. We all pass debt around to each other in this system. The monetary system provides opportunities for those people and those institutions who create, manage, and receive interest payments to turn our debt into their profit, then exchange profit for control of items with real value. The Federal Reserve prints dollar bills for the Congress of the United States for use by the citizens in exchange for treasury bonds equaling the amount of the dollar bills printed plus interest. Take note of the word bill because it is exactly that, a bill or debt to be paid by the issuer. Since interest is paid on all printed money, each dollar is really a debt instrument that can only be paid through labor. Therefore, our labor gives today's money its value because we have to work for it to pay for our living expenses. And if we don't, then we won't have what we need to survive. The Federal Reserve and the U.S. Congress are simply exchanging printed pieces of paper. In actuality, the money isn't worth the paper it is printed on. Since only 3% of the money in circulation exists as paper money and 97% of all money only exists digitally in virtual networks. The fallacy of the system is that because the Fed allows private banks to have only 10% in reserves and lends up to 90%, this means $9 out of every $10 was created out of nothing. It doesn't exist anywhere. They didn't even bother to print it. This also means that the money supply must continually expand to create the appearance of prosperity. For example, if I told you I would lend you as much money as you want to borrow for the rest of your life, why would you pay anything back? You would just keep borrowing until you die, right? The only thing that holds a monetary-based economy together is the existence of credit, because credit controls how much you can borrow. There are only two types of people today, debtors and creditors. And guess who the creditor is? You and I and every living, breathing man and woman are right. 
I realize that you may not have known we were the creditors because we always seem to be in debt and we always seem to owe some corporation something. Banks used to print notes to show how much they had in reserve. But there is nothing in reserve anymore. These are instruments of public debt. The bank prints and exchanges the notes for treasury bonds, equaling the amount of the dollar bills printed plus interest. Bonds are the primary way that governments borrow money. You hear all the time about government debt, right? Well, issuing bonds is how the governments do most of their borrowing. They are financing debt. Who are they borrowing from? From their creditors. And who are their creditors? Whoever invests the government bonds is the debt owner and expects to be repaid. You may have heard of municipal bonds, perhaps issued by your local town or city. If you buy one of those, that means you are their creditor. The government must pay you back the face value of the bond, which is how much you paid for it or lent the city, plus the interest also stated on the bond. So, the United States government issues a bond to the Federal Reserve Bank for the amount of Federal Reserve notes, money, it prints, plus interest. This creates a debt owed by the United States and its citizens. The Department of Treasury collects payments in the form of taxes. The department that handles that is the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS. To help it sink in, let me give you a little more of the backstory. Curiously, during the Great Depression in the early 1930s, a group of international businessmen presented then-President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, with a demand to redeem in gold the deposit certificates they now own. Those dollar bills said redeemable in gold. This meant you could take your money to the bank and exchange it for gold. The problem was that the government had legalized fractional lending in the early 1900s, a scheme ongoing since the early days of banking in the 1700s. This meant that the banks had issued far more certificates than gold. President Roosevelt knew they did not have all the gold available to cover the deposit certificates this group of international businessmen presented. This couldn't have happened at a worse time. There was what would later become known as the Great Depression, Hitler's attempt to take Europe, and now the United States Treasury did not have enough gold to redeem the certificate. Very similar to what happened to the ancient Roman Empire. This meant the United States was now bankrupt. Fearing the repercussions of such an announcement to the American people and the world, given the state of affairs, a secret deal was negotiated instead. This is what was really meant by the New Deal. The group of international businessmen would accept full ownership of the Federal Reserve Bank, moving it from a public trust to a privately owned and operated bank, just as they had already done to the Bank of France, the Bank of England, and other banks all around the world using similar takeover strategies. Along with ownership came the exclusive right to print all money for the United States from that day forward, as it was the only way to ensure payment. With Executive Order 6073, reopening banks on March 10, 1933, the United States had a new overlord. This was in the backdrop of the bank runs, closing of the banks, confiscation of the gold, and reopening of the banks in the 1930s under President Roosevelt, and those actions remain in effect until today. As of February 5, 2013, the total combined public debt was $16.481 trillion. 
as of August 31, 2020, federal debt held by the public was $20.83 trillion. According to the Federal Reserve, as of December 31, 2020, there was $2,040.7 billion in circulation, totaling 50.3 billion notes in volume, meaning the rest of the debt is for interest, and those Federal Reserve notes were never printed. Even if all the Federal Reserve notes were confiscated to pay off the national debt, it would not be enough. Therefore, paying off the nation's debt is an impossibility. The objective of the monetary system is to create perpetual debt and steal our life force by rendering all citizens mere beasts of labor. By operating in bankruptcy, which the United States has been doing since 1933, labor is the only real currency and it is evidence of a debt. In a debt economy, the net worth is negative, and two negatives equal a positive. As a result, an instrument of debt, Federal Reserve note payable in a bankrupt system becomes a positive mathematically. All we are doing is passing debt around between each other. It must be paid, and the only way to pay it is with labor. The replacement for money is credit. Whoever has the best credit will always appear to be richer because they can borrow the most while the people with bad credit can borrow the least. With more credit comes access to more capital or more debt, which is the same thing. Poverty creates a welfare state that functions like an army of people who depend on the government for their welfare. The poor must constantly go to the government for a fix just like a drug addict. This allows the establishment to control them via the government by determining when and where they live and eat. The establishment will always have popular support because the poor depend on it for their welfare. Prosperity moves in a circular motion and most people are outside the circle trying their best to grab as much as possible before it flies past them. Some grab a lot, and some grab a little. But the only guaranteed way to be prosperous is to become one of those who pass the wealth around. Produce something, anything that is in demand. Don't just be a consumer because producers and the world banking structure pass money around the circle to each other, laughing as the worker and consumer grab for it, but only get enough of it to consume. To have all our needs met and become debt-free, we must first forget everything that we thought we knew about money. It's more critical to unlearn how we think about money works than the future of money can be more easily be implemented. Society doesn't even need money, and we most certainly don't need banks. Cryptocurrencies replace banks and allow individuals to trade with each other directly without an intermediary. It gives financial power back to the people. Legacy systems of control rely on middlemen and centralization of authority. Entire industries of wholesalers, retailers, agents, churches, and brokers position themselves between consumers and creators. The whole purpose of a decentralized version of the internet is to eliminate intermediaries of all types and put people back in direct relationships with each other. But until then, we must not hold our accumulated value in the means of exchange that has no real value. Instead of stashing bags of cash that lose value by the day, we must learn to keep our wealth in resources that can be used to maintain the survival of life, such as land, water, and other natural resources. We only need to keep enough money to operate the day-to-day -day functions of life and business. No good can come to the world 
by having the wealth of a few men surpass the combined monetary worth of populations of entire countries, even if they promise to do good with it. Having the accumulated life work of human beings stored digitally as numbers in a computer network stops the circulation of life needs from existing on the same energetic frequency that people live in, thus causing suffering to others. The human cost of such individual accumulation is not worth the present and future consequences. Chapter 4 The Future of Money Money was first created because the barter system had a problem. If you can't find someone who wants what you have and has what you want, you can't trade with them. Money was created to be the medium of exchange that allows peer-to-peer -peer trading of any item of value. In the past, people have used many things as money. The most durable thing that has been used as money over time is gold and silver. But large amounts of gold coins are not portable. People also needed someplace safe to keep their gold and silver, so banks were created. Banks charge fees for holding other people's money. Bankers have become rich by being the intermediaries between people trading for hundreds of years. The primary intellectual property held by banks was their ability to keep a ledger with accurate records of accounts, recording all money going in and all money going out of an account. But banks became expensive to operate. They must pay for buildings, lawyers, and executives. The high costs are passed on to their customers in the form of interest and fees. In the name of security and the fractional lending policies, banks limit how and when we can access our money and how much of our money we can move around. Banks became cozy with governments and had zero competition resulting in no motivation to improve their services. Governments deemed banks too big and necessary to fail, incentivizing the greed of banks. They took advantage of their customers and crashed economies without consequence. As a result, the money suffered from inflation and constant manipulation. Then, the global financial crisis of 2008 took the world like a storm. It was a severe worldwide economic crisis in the early 21st century. It was the most severe financial crisis since the Great Depression 80 years prior. Incidentally, or maybe predictably, according to books like The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order by Ray Dalio, every 80 years or so, a crisis destroys an old order and creates a new one. The 2008 global financial crisis was primarily caused by government deregulation that allowed banks to risk customers' money in derivatives in the financial industry. The financial regulators and the bankers became the same, taking turns serving years as regulators and bankers. Banks then demanded more mortgages to support the profitable sale of these derivatives. They created interest-only loans with balloon payments and adjustable interest rates that became affordable to subprime borrowers who could not afford such loans. Something had to be done. The time was ripe for a new form of money to be devised. Meanwhile, in the same year, a mysterious computer coder known as Satoshi Nakamoto invented a digital money called Bitcoin, which runs on blockchain technology. No one knows who Satoshi is. He remains anonymous. Bitcoin's completely digital currency network is decentralized. It has no central authority, regulators, or governing bodies to police thieves and hackers. 
Just like paper money, Bitcoin is stored in wallets. But Bitcoin's wallets are digital and are stored on the blockchain. Blockchain is a publicly shared immutable ledger that records transactions on a network. The transactions can be tangible, a house, car, cash, land, or intangible, intellectual property, patents, copyrights, branding. Virtually anything of value can be tracked, transferred, and traded on a blockchain network reducing risk and cutting costs and middlemen. Transactions are blocked together in an irreversible chain called a blockchain. These blocks form a chain of data. The blocks confirm the exact time and sequence of transactions. The blocks link securely to prevent any block from being altered or a block inserted between two existing blocks because members share a single view of the truth, anyone can see all details of a transaction end-to-end, -end, providing greater confidence and new efficiencies and opportunities. Bitcoin wallets can be used as bank accounts to access stored value. Each Bitcoin wallet has a unique address that can send and receive value. Bitcoin can be sent directly from one person to another, anywhere in the world, without a middleman, without limits, and completely anonymously. Blockchain technology enables people to store, send, and receive units of value without any banks or credit cards. Bitcoin was a breakthrough because it solved the double spend problem. Digital money is just like a computer file so it would be easy for somebody to just copy and paste it. Before Bitcoin, the only solution was for banks to keep a record of all the transactions in their customers' accounts so that nobody could spend money twice. Bitcoin solved the double spend problem by making all accounts and transactions public without revealing private details like names. If someone tries to spend the same Bitcoin twice, it's quickly discovered and prevented. Blockchains use a crypto consensus mechanism that forms the foundation of all blockchains. The basic idea of achieving consensus on a blockchain is to create a way that many different nodes can agree that certain transactions are valid when blocks are formed. No one can cheat the system by making fake transactions with money they don't have, and the same funds can't be sent twice. Bitcoin was a transformative technological innovation because of achieving crypto consensus as a solution to the double spend problem. One of the hidden costs of the banking system is inflation. Inflation means that the money we spend decreases in spending power every day. It's why an ice cream cone cost five cents in 1950, but it's five dollars today. Bitcoin's limited supply creates the opposite effect, called deflation. This means the value of each Bitcoin is designed to increase over time. It's one of the reasons why so many people are excited about investing in Bitcoin. It can be used by anyone, anywhere in the world. There are no dollars, euro, pesos, or yen. It's a world currency. Bitcoin is not centrally controlled by any person, company, or government. A community of its users runs Bitcoin. Bitcoin users are located worldwide and need the internet to send and receive payments. Bitcoin works even when people do not know each other. This makes Bitcoin corruption-free. Government-controlled fiat money can only be spent in amounts set by the bank. But Bitcoin can be spent in much smaller amounts, called satoshis, up to eight decimal places. This means that it can be used even for very tiny purchases. Then, in 2013, a programmer named Vitalik Buterin 
developed Ethereum, which also works on a blockchain just like Bitcoin but with smart contract functionality. The Ethereum network opened up the floodgates for programmers to start creating ecosystems of cryptocurrencies, dawning the birth of the Web 3.0 version of the Internet. Web 1.0 was the first deployed Internet in the 1990s. It didn't have algorithms, only offering access to limited information with little to no user interaction. Web 2.0 started in 2005 and continues into the 2020s. Data is primarily stored in centralized repositories owned by large companies like Google, Apple, and Facebook. Web 3.0 is the third generation of the Internet. Promises that data will be interconnected in a decentralized way and owned by end users built on blockchain technology and enabled by cryptocurrencies. The crypto in cryptocurrency refers to encryption. A cryptocurrency is an encrypted data stream that denotes a unit that can represent anything of value. Web 3.0 products promise to be censorship resistance, decentralized, permissionless, trustless, autonomous, transparent, non-confiscatable, global, and potentially evens the playing field between the elites and the masses. Decentralization can be applied to data, finance, or organizations. It refers to systems built to not rely on centralized control, but instead by aggregating the decision of its members. The tenets of being permissionless and trustless refer to public blockchain networks that are open and available to everyone to participate in the systematized process, eliminating the need for members who use the network to know or trust each other to operate on the network successfully. Censorship resistance refers to the activity on a crypto network that prevents any entity, including governments, from altering, stopping, or otherwise censoring the activity. The global design of blockchain technology refers to the notion that geographic location is irrelevant when using blockchain networks. The traits of blockchain-based assets allow them not to be confiscated by a non-owner of the asset when set up and used correctly. The world needs to change for us to reach our highest potential. People have been screaming for change for generations, marked by constant social outcry, attempting to push the world forward. In 2011, the Occupy Wall Street protest movement against economic inequality and the influence of money in politics began in Zuccotti Park located in New York City's Wall Street Financial District. It gave rise to the broader Occupy movement in over 951 cities across 82 countries. The Occupy movement was crushed in 2012. The fight for $15 forwarded the idea of a $15 minimum wage into mainstream acceptance. A Brookings Institution report released in November 2019 found that more than 53 million people, or 44% of all workers ages 18 to 64, earn low hourly wages. Many families need more than two jobs to make ends meet, including one-fifth of all school teachers. The new slogan for many unions is now one job should be enough. In 2013, Patrice Colors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi formed the Black Lives Matter Network. Black Lives Matter started as a hashtag in response to the acquittal of teenager Trayvon Martin's murderer, George Zimmerman. It soon became a movement to campaign against violence and systemic racism toward black people, 
racial disparities, including the criminal justice system, bank lending, and job markets, tenants' rights, the inability to buy homes, more middle-class families are renting and competing with the poor for scarce apartments, so landlords raise rents. More than half of all renters spend more than 30% of their incomes to keep a roof over their heads. This has triggered a renter's revolt, rent strikes, mounted campaigns for rent control, protections against unfair evictions, and local funding for more affordable rental housing. Voting rights. Local governments adopt laws restricting voting rights, unemployment benefits, Medicaid, education spending, abortion, civil rights, and environmental regulations. Environmental activism. Student activists on college campuses began demanding that their institutions divest stock in corporations that profit from the use and abuse of fossil fuels, the primary cause of the global climate crisis. Since its inception, more than 1,150 institutions with more than $11 trillion in assets committed to divesting from fossil fuels, including local governments, pension funds, religious institutions, and universities. Universal Basic Income, UBI, is a government guaranteed payment that each citizen receives. It is also called a citizen's income, guaranteed minimum income, or basic income. The payments intend to provide enough to cover the basic cost of living and establish a sense of financial security for everyone. The concept is also seen as a means to offset job losses caused by technology. Since money powers everything in the world, attempting to solve problems and change the world without solving things at the root, money level becomes an impossibility. The most effective way to change anything is to change the lowest denominator. Improve the money and you improve the world in every way. Improving how money is distributed and how people access money eliminate the bottleneck preventing the improvements in society people are demanding. Lack of resources has never been the problem. Improper and imbalanced distribution of world resources has been the problem. For anyone who wants to make an impact in improving the world, crypto is the single best tool because it works on the root problem. Crypto and blockchain technology are being applied to every industry. Traditional money started as only a medium of exchange because it could be objectively quantified and measured, unlike the things of value that it is exchanged for. The technology did not exist to objectively quantify and measure independent value items. Somewhere along the line, money became the means society used to measure and quantify everything. The original purpose of money was lost, and it became the end goal instead of the means to the end. Not only did money change, but money also changed us. It's an important lesson not to repeat in the era of cryptocurrencies despite their advantages over fiat currencies. With cryptography, we can measure and quantify items of value in the same way we measure and quantify money. This puts money on equal footing with items of real value once fully implemented. It allows an objective way to solve inequalities because when things are not quantifiable, we use the money to quantify them and measure them. Teachers are not paid as much as other professions because we can't measure their importance to society quantifiably. After all, the results are measured over the lifetime of their pupils. We know teachers serve an essential purpose in society. Still, they do not receive high compensation 
because their results cannot be measured and quantified on an individual basis, but only through the lens of money. But it's possible with crypto and blockchain to create an algorithm for almost anything of value so that money can serve its true purpose of being a medium of exchange rather than the only means to quantify and determine how much something is valued. For instance, let us consider the following tongue-in-cheek scenario. Suppose there was a teacher token that tokenized the value of teachers in a fully deployed cryptocurrency world. In that case, the actual value teachers provide could be determined based on the success of their pupils, for instance. The price of the teacher token would represent the value that the teachers provide and would rise and fall independent of money itself. This type of algorithm of almost anything of value can be crafted with things from strawberries to shoes, cars, bags, eggs, or water. A version of this scenario shows how huge social norms can be shifted by tweaking how value is determined and how the relationship between money and value can be balanced. Today, there are Web 3.0 projects built on blockchain and enabled by cryptocurrencies, rethinking entire swaths of social functions, from money to investing, gaming, and even voting. The next round of Web 3.0 companies will change how we do many things. Decentralized finance, DeFi, is changing how we lend borrow, send and receive money without centralized authorities in faster, cheaper, and easier ways. Community inclusion currencies, CICs, are local money used to pay for goods and services. CICs are not meant to replace national currency. They are complementary currencies designed to support local commerce. CICs provide a medium for daily spending in trade, while allowing individuals to save national currency, which can be volatile or scarce, for interactions with larger businesses and government institutions outside of the immediate community. Blockchain games allow players to own and control their in-game assets to benefit from in-game economies. Non-fungible tokens, NFTs, are unique, non-interchangeable assets minted on-chain. NFTs create exciting use cases in digital art, collectibles, ticketing, gaming, digital ownership, etc. The digital art industry alone stands to reach $315 million in 2020. Just because you take a picture of the Mona Lisa doesn't mean you own it. That's where NFTs come in. NFTs are digital items with built-in proof of ownership. It uses blockchain smart contracts to prove your ownership not of a copy, but of the original item. NFTs are already changing the world and causing controversy. What makes this technology special is its many applications. The features that make an NFT is, one, uniqueness measured by rarity. The more unique NFTs are, the more they are valued and are scarce. The less the number of NFTs, the higher the price will be due to their rare availability. Two, indivisibility. Unlike cryptocurrencies that are divisible into small fractions of itself, NFTs are impossible to divide into smaller denominations. Hence, they are said to be indivisible, and you cannot transfer even a tiny portion of NFTs to anyone. Indestructibility NFTs are well organized and stored in blockchain with a high level of security. It means that the stored information cannot be destroyed, removed, or replicated. 
Blockchain makes it possible to track the actual owner of NFTs and eliminates the need for third-party verification. 4. Non-interoperability The comprehensive data of NFT is secured and stored in a blockchain. It implies that the stored information cannot be exchanged for another non-fungible object for the same one because it is unique and rare. Non-fungible assets can be both physical and digital. An example of a physical non-fungible asset could be a plane ticket. It is unique with your name and seat number written on it. It is indivisible as you will not be able to sell a part of it as well as change for another one. NFTs are just one form of cryptographic blockchain technology that are changing the world across a variety of sectors. NFTs will be integrated into many types of digital assets such as house plans, themes, mock-ups and domain names, music, art, designs, any form of media. The entertainment industry has faced numerous cases of fraud and copyright issues. The advent of NFT will make it possible to append every media item to blockchain as an NFT. NFTs can help prevent files from being duplicated or shared without permission. They also ensure the elimination of fake news as they provide proof of origin. Besides its obvious use for collectibles like trading cards, comic books, and sports memorabilia, NFTs are also popular in the gaming industry since these tokens solve some of their internal difficulties. By implementing NFTs into in-game assets, they can easily be transferred and sold between players. NFTs give artists a way to sell work while maintaining the copyright of their work and shares of future royalties as the value of their art increases over time. When a collector buys a piece of artwork, they own the NFT, while the copyright still depends on the artist's choice. The artist can either choose to give the copyright of the asset to the buyer or retain it. The copyright holds every piece of information related to the artwork, such as the artist's details, asset value, date of origin, previous owners, etc. NFTs can be used to tokenize real-world assets. They can ensure smooth real estate transactions without any third-party involvement, such as banks or brokers. When implemented, NFTs erase any possibility of conflict over ownership of assets in the real or virtual world. Identity theft is a huge real-world problem that can be solved with NFTs. NFTs are perfect for preventing identification fraud. Examples of things that can be digitized to represent identity include qualifications, medical reports, deeds, titles, and other proof of ownership documents or even games to avoid counterfeits. NFTs are key to creating the metaverses of the future the Metaverse is a collective virtual shared space created by the convergence of virtually enhanced physical reality and physically persistent virtual space, including the sum of all virtual worlds, augmented reality, and the Internet. Blockchain technology promises to empower individuals through secure, transparent, and non-censorable systems for digital voting. An application of this technology is governance and on-chain voting, which provide an opportunity for free and open democracy. When each vote can be verified and is tamper-proof, users know that their vote is submitted and counts toward the outcome. This is vital for participation and 
method is valid for small communities, petitions, local governance, and much larger communities, such as national elections. To be effective, voting must be easy with few constraints, allow for anonymity, be scalable for users, very inexpensive, so no one is excluded, and ideally able to run from a smartphone. Votes must be trackable in real time and not censorable by any entity. Decentralized Autonomous Organizations DAOs, are member-owned communities without centralized leadership. A safe way to collaborate with internet strangers. A safe place to commit funds to a specific cause. Rules are encoded as a transparent computer program, controlled by the organization's members and not influenced by a central government closed-door board of directors. B2B and enterprise applications across various industries, including accounting and stock markets. Cryptocurrency for events and conferences provides easy onboarding usage, and rewards for event participants. Crypto won't give us the post-money society we deserve, but it will bring us one step closer to realizing the post-money utopia we all wished we lived in. The Post-Money Society I realize that perhaps it is difficult to imagine a society that is any different than the one we live in now. Working is all most of us have known our entire lives. But in recent history, humans have tried only a few types of economies. Capitalism, socialism, imperialism, feudalism, and communism are the major ones. But none of these models has been ideal. And while capitalism may be the best of the bunch, it's far from perfect. Might you imagine this, a society in which food, shelter, education, and security are human rights at birth for all humans, regardless of class, that is funded by billions of lifespans over millions of years of work already done by previous human generations. Then all earthlings would be born free of financial worries. How can this happen? It is not that the earth doesn't have enough wood to build homes for everyone. It's not that we lack sufficient human intellect. It's not that the planet can't grow enough food to feed everyone. And the only reason we fear for our lives is that when some people don't have sufficient food or shelter, they become criminals or try to cut corners make a few extra bucks, or squeeze out a little more profit, all of which ultimately passes human need from one household to another instead of providing for it. So, if all survival needs were provided for from birth, there would be hardly any crime, and not much need for laws or prisons. Since you would not have to work to stay alive, Everyone can dedicate their lives to building the future and inventing systems that improve conditions for all life forms. The essential job in this reality would be developing, managing, and distributing the Earth's resources to ensure everyone's needs are met. If we need more food, simply plant it or genetically engineer it. We would need a new monetary system and a new economic system. The current version of money would not be necessary because development would no longer be about if we can afford to build something. It would be, do we have the resources, the knowledge, and the labor to do so? The economic model I am referring to is a resource-based economy made famous by Jacques Fresco. A resource-based economy is a system in which all goods and services are available without using any systems of debt or servitude, like money, credits, or barter. All resources become the common heritage of all people, not just a select few. 
In this system, natural resources that provide for human needs can't be owned and sold by any individual, but can only be refined for use. Water, land, plants, animals, etc. are all provided free of charge by the Earth. These resources would be used as needed by and among all humans. Intellectual development would be a part of human equity in a post-money society. The capitalist ideology of self-interest would be replaced with the inheritance of equity at birth. They enable anyone to build and iterate on top of existing progress and push human advancement to new heights. In our current model, intellectual property is hoarded by corporations that only use it for profit. An extreme example is Monsanto, which developed genetically modified terminator seeds that would resist its own herbicide, Roundup, offering farmers a convenient way to spray fields with weed killer without affecting crops. Monsanto then patented the seeds. Since terminator seeds are sterile in the second generation, Monsanto also requires farmers to buy seeds from them annually. The purchase of seeds annually is crippling, especially for farmers in developing countries. By contrast, blockchain smart contracts and many decentralized applications are open source. By design, open source software licenses promote collaboration, transparency, trust, and sharing because they permit other people to modify source code and incorporate those changes into their projects. Openness, not regulation or secrecy, creates blockchain's security and reliability. A popular feature of cryptocurrencies is to ensure that the unbanked people can access banking solutions and use crypto as an alternative to national currencies devastated by extreme inflation. Software developers in all countries can participate in blockchain development due to the open source access of most blockchain code. As of June 2020, more than 50 million people have blockchain wallets. The global blockchain market reached over 5 billion in 2021. In only 13 years, blockchain advancement is still in its youthful years. In a post-money society, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, smart contracts would manage how much resources and human labor is required to fulfill all needs in abundant amounts. Meanwhile, engineers and scientists, aided by artificial intelligence, would build the systems and technologies to develop restorative ways to produce and distribute the necessary amount from natural resources. All this while maintaining adequate recycling and regenerative means for the continuation of all the natural resources by the Earth. Such a system would use human ingenuity to invent technologies that would gradually free Earthlings from labor. When a new machine is developed to do manufacturing, people are upset because that means an Earthling will lose their job. However, this need not be the case. People would simply be compensated with their own time back while maintaining no reduction in income. When combined with a currency that is not inflationary or maybe even deflationary, nothing would be lost by the worker. People would be free and live a primarily free life with much more time to pursue their passions to benefit us all. We would now be living according to a pack model, which would be better than the eat-what-you-kill model we currently live in. The Earth has enough natural energy and resources now. We have enough knowledge now. 
We also have enough ability and labor to build the technology necessary to free all earthlings of work and all its ills. Generations in the future would inherit such a high standard of living that we would be able to pursue spiritual advancement, space travel, and even populate the oceans with cities if we wanted to. But since we didn't develop that kind of society generations ago, we have nothing to inherit except a monetary system that is a pyramid scheme of the highest order based on ascending wage levels. In reality, all human labor has the same value. The only variance is the scarcity of labor in various sectors. Most people never realize that when they work and receive the type of money in exchange, money constantly decreases in value due to increased money supply interest rates. When the central bank prints additional money, it has a negative effect called inflation that makes money already in circulation able to buy less goods because the supply of money has increased. In a fiat monetary system, money, the same as labor, is ruled by supply and demand. With the fiat monetary system in place, each person is automatically born into debt since each human life requires food, shelter, and security, and these things cost money. Most people have parents who take on the debt inherited from our birth for a specific period until we are expected to pay for our survival. Labor is what you do to pay debts. Any labor in excess of our debt, the cost to our lives, is our net worth. The point at which we begin to earn above the cost of living is usually where money problems should improve but it often gets worse and worse. At this point, the point of just over broke, J-O-B, is that most people begin to stagnate the flow of money by living above their means. The expulsion of more labor energy for higher and higher pay is seen as the only way to increase money and thus security. People who have little or no inheritance, or those whose parents may not be able to afford to pay for the living expenses of their childhood, inherit more debt in the form of lack of education, knowledge, and a skill that would allow them to enter the workforce and use their labor in a meaningful and beneficial manner. Instead, they become stuck never being able to lift their wages above the level of their living expenses. They are doomed to live forever in financial poverty and pass on their poverty to their children and taxpayers in society. Therefore, it's essential to strive toward a post-money society by embracing blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, and a resource-based economic model to put us on the path to a better future. When resources can be mapped using cryptography to blockchains, all things of value that humans require can be objectively measured and quantified independently of money and distributed in a balanced way. This type of efficiency in the system will reduce waste and help build an excellent regenerative society for the world and its inhabitants. Instead of experimenting with world population reduction methods that could eventually lead to our extinction. As humans, our occupation should be to live for a living. The Earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more than our skeleton is bone invested with cells. The Earth is geological. This geological entity grows people. Alan Watts